for a lighter hearted look at weeds. Okay, are weeds there to annoy and frustrate you? Are they there to wear out your tractor and your slasher? Are they where to increase your herbicide usage? Or take advantage of ecological nicks, nicks? Or are they there to become naturalised or all of the above? Sometimes when we look at weeds, we just get that frustrated. We just want to what? Kill them and get rid of them and then we'll worry about the next lot later on. So think about weeds, what their purpose is, their form and their function. And start thinking to yourself a little question while you're sitting there so you can ponder on this one. What is your most common weed? Do you have notebooks? Do you want to chuck it on your notebook? Just write it down. What is your most common weed? Okay. Name your weed which is most difficult to manage. I said manage, not kill. A slight difference on that one. And name the newest weed which has actually come onto your farm or could be in the region. So what can happen is that as with this climatic change is occurring, we're going to end up with these new ecological niches and all of a sudden these plants start to invade. So if you think about it, write down your list of what weeds grow throughout the year. What happens when you get that first rain event? And I remember what Simon just said, it could be quite a major one. Think about the difference between your perennial and your annual weeds as well. Start thinking about if you're going to develop up a new block, what sort of weeds, how are you going to try and tackle them? From a grazing perspective, are you dealing with more bare ground or not? What sort of weeds have you had in the past? And are you getting a pattern that's coming through? And the bottom one down there is can you actually put your weeds in some form of order? Now, last time I was up here, I um, met an older farmer <coughs> and he came up to me and he said, well, you've done a good job. I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. I said, why have I done a good job? He goes, well, people were talking about all these weeds and he said, but if they took the time to look at them, he said a lot of weeds that he was dealing with was cycling through. So... Start thinking to yourself, particularly when you're thinking about the patterns and that sort of thing, if you've got a weed that's coming into your property, how long is it going to be to cycle through or is it actually going to become naturalised? So here's the tough questions. We've basically got around about 2,000 major weeds in Australia. Okay. Um, do you have them all? No. No. <laughs> If you go and you kill out a plant, are you going to get new ones come through or are you going to get a worse one come through? And there is this issue, particularly when you go to West Australia, of herbicide resistance. So Aubrey talks about turning plants on with productivity. As Daniel said, calcium-magnesium ratios, potassium-sodium ratios. Think about your soil pH, not just the individual elements. That's not me, is it? No, good. Um, I'm just going to briefly show this one. It cost me about 450 bucks to put together a few years ago. Um, you've got your nutrient supply coming down here and you've got your production coming up here. The purpose I'm showing you this one is that from a nutritional point of view, you put a small amount of fertiliser on and you get a great response. You get to a situation whereby you put on literally 50% more fertiliser and you hardly get a response. The one I want you to think about is that if you go ahead and you put on too much fertiliser or too much of anything, excess equals deficiency, you start going which what? Backward. So when people start thinking about, okay, how can I use corrective chemistry or whatever, particularly dealing with weeds, just remember there's a law of diminishing return. The more you put on, the less response you get. So not just adjusting chemistry, but you've got to start thinking about yourself, OK, how can I deal with things? Historically, from an Australian perspective, we've used single superphosphate to turn productivity on. But just remember, if you use an excess, you can kill things very well. They used to use boron as a herbicide. 
if I had more time, I'd tell you about my exercise of using boron on a pasture with a fair bit of moisture in it. And what happened to the pasture? My neighbour rang me up and said, I thought you don't use herbicide because it looked like I what? Yeah, okay. So just be a bit cautious with boron. So I'm just going to go through a couple of books now. Um, this book here is probably one of your key books, an American book, um, Weeds and Why They Grow. It used to be around about 200 bucks. It's now come down in price over the years. You can see it's quite an old book, but it's probably one of the best books out there. And what it does, it actually relates the weed to the actual mineral componentry of it. The Wondrous World of Weeds, an Australian one with Pat Collins. And what I'll just talk about here for a second. So um, Pfeiffer's book, Weeds and What They Tell from a Biodynamic Perspective, is a really great book. You've got Weeds, Guardians of the Soil. That's what Pat's book looks like. You've got the Working with Weeds by um, Kate Wall. So this is a relatively new book out of Brisbane, my fault. Um, it's probably about 18 months old. Here comes the official ad. Is it 30 or 35 bucks? Oh, I can't even get them down to 30 bucks. So that's your local production. And this is the one that um, if you're looking at trying to relate weeds, just remember if you're going to look at this one, it's American publication, but it actually goes through and tells you what the elements are that it wants and also high and low levels. And please don't nick my copy. I do with the pinger. I've lost it. What am I? Oh, yep. Yeah. Somebody's got really good observational skills, so thank you. <laughs> now, coming on to some concepts, you've got two extremes. You can have moss that hasn't got a root into it slow growing, you've got nitrate weeds. How fast do nitrate weeds grow? Whoosh, like jet fuel. They're very soft. They often have fibrous root systems on the top and they're rapid growth. There's your two extremes from form and function. If we start thinking about it this way too, come on, work, that start thinking about, I don't know if you've heard of this term, weed behaviour management. How is the weed behaving in your landscape? I've actually come up with 16 categories. It's only taken me 23 years to work it out, so I've been a bit slow, so you've got to put up with me. But this index will actually give you some idea, and that's part of the 14-page document, which you can get as well. I'm not holding back on this one. And most of the time, when I talk about the categories, I've been talking teaching kids, and if we can get nice, simple names, it's easy to remember. So, we've got our pioneer weeds. They're the first lot to come out very small, shallow root systems. You hardly notice them. They're like if a volcano comes up and first lot of weeds that come through. You've got your high rises. They're about that tall, tend to be long and skinny with um, sort of smaller root systems. You've got your fortresses. Imagine you're an ant and you're coming up to a tussock. How big's the tussock? Like a fortress. They're there when things are pretty bad because they're actually trying to protect the little bit of ground underneath them. You've got your rusty wire, which is your high silica plants, the ones that when you get the whipper snipper and you hit them, you run out of string. You've got your armed ones, which have got spikes, thorns, prickles, whatever it's going to be. And often when we talk about thistles, I associate that with overgrazing. Um, to some degree, you'll end up with your armed plants will disappear and then literally your rusty wire will come in and then your fortress plants actually when you're going backwards. You've got your jackhammers. Jackhammers are only, what, this long? They only go down about that deep as a taproot. Then you can go down to your drilling rigs. The drilling rigs go down a long way. When you start seeing the drilling rigs, the woody, the woody reeds coming in, start thinking about it this way. There's no minerals in the top few inches, so these drilling rigs have to go down deep to get the minerals to recycle them back up. So when you start to get into a woody weed problem, it's telling you there's a major drama. You've got your golden nuggets. They're basically ones that have got rhizomes or stalls, uh, stolons 
um, rhizomes underneath. So they're really holding the nutrient down deep. The reason being often because you've either cut the top or you've grazed it so tightly that the plant has to hold its nutrient down deep in the ground so it can regrow. You've got your soil tillers. They're the grasses often that are trying to aggregate the soil. So when you've got a lot of soil disturbances, you tend to stimulate the grasses to come through. You've got your bio lumps, which are basically your legumes. You've got your balloon weeds. So these are the... These are your nitrate weeds. I call a balloon weed. Imagine if you've got a balloon which is small and you blow it up, right? That sort of really expansive leaf plant. You've got your spider weeds. So a spider weed is when you've got... Can you hold this for a second? You've got a central plant here and then the other leaves spread out from it like, like a spider. So the purpose of that one is to take the nitrate that's in one place and spread it out over the soil surface. You've got your umbrella weeds. So that would be like a pumpkin whereby they trail a long way. They're taking the nitrate and spreading it out and the leaf itself looks like an umbrella. You've got your vines. So the purpose of the vines is the fact that you can have nutrient in one area and there's an excess of nitrate and it's trying to spread it out. Hit that one. Sorry. Then you've got your tent bushes. Uh, Lantana is one of those. So the concept of a bush is that it actually goes to the ground. It's multi sprigged and it's actually trying to put a tent to protect the ground. Blackberries issue down south. Then you've got a bowl of soup. In other words, they're the weeds that are in um, very wet areas. So they're your main categories. Um, I want to do a cartoon book for kids, so I'll put them into Spikedon, make something a bit interesting for the kids. Within the 16 groups, we now break it down to five categories, covering the soil, defending the soil, topsoil builders, which are mainly deep-rooted plants, nitrogen regulators, which you can either have the legumes or you can have the nitrate weeds, and the ecosystem renovators, which is probably what you more call the environmental weeds. Now, you're covering the ground with just your simple pioneers and those high-rise plants. Just remember with the high-rise plants that grow up, they fall over and that's increasing your ground cover. Often the high-rise plants have got sticks in them and it takes a long time for that organic matter to break down and that's the purpose of trying to cover the, with organic matter for a long period of time, not a short period of time. You've got your defenders of the soil, your fortresses, your high silica plants and your general weeds and burrs type plants. You've got your topsoil builders. Now, with your topsoil builders, don't focus on what they're doing on the top. Focus what they're doing down here. They're actually, most of them have got that taproot. We talked about dieback. You've got your rhizome and your stolons. It's about trying to hold the nutrient underneath the ground because there's so much attack on them from the top. And also, just think about the root-to-shoot ratio, that in effect, the roots is what is the powerhouse in these soil-building plants. You've got your nitrogen regulators. As I said before, these are the ones that are building it. Now, just a little comment on nitrogen regulation. Some people may actually have a grass and they say, well, I want to try and grow legumes, so they put the legume seeds in, and what do they do? They don't grow because if the nitrate levels are very oops sorry, if the nitrate levels are very high, they can't grow. It's the same old thing. If you've got a high nitrate soil and you try and put a legume in, it won't grow. So start to look and understand what the form and function of the plants are, and sometimes just trying to say why isn't that plant growing there? I just want to throw some seed in. Is simply not going to work. Now, with the ecosystem renovators, um, these plants can grow very, very rapidly. And I'm just going to grab something for a second. Sir, can you come over here for a second? You don't have to drink it. Thank you. OK, you don't have to drink that one. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Now, what can happen is that if this was a landscape which was fully rehydrated, 
It's like have. <laughs> Sorry, keep a straight face, all right? So what's going to happen if you've got a rehydrated landscape with plenty of water in it, the organic matter is actually all the way through it. Once the landscape dries out, you've got a high concentration of nutrient, what, in a very small area? So what can happen is that these nitrate weeds are taking off and these environmental weeds are taking off because you've got so much nutrient in a very small confined space. That's why they're there, because we've actually lost the water out of it. Do you want to take that one to your table? Thank you. So nitrate weed characteristics, we had a look at those before. They tend to be very quick growing, the amaranths and the um, mellows. Just coming on to this one, how are you going to deal with nitrate weeds? Do peop are people familiar with the term nitrate weeds? Okay, so if you've got a cattle camp and you see those plants that are growing really rapidly around it. If you go through and you say um, often where you can end up um, at the bottom of a valley where there's a lot of fertility. So um, the amaranths, um, inkweed. Do you get stinking roger up here? You get stinking rogers and nitrate weed as well? So to overcome those, if we think about the word carbohydrate, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen... So if you've got carbohydrate plus nitrogen equals protein. So working on that assumption, if we have an excess of nitrogen, what we can actually start to do is say to yourself, right, can I try and put some old carbohydrate in? From a stock perspective, if you've got very high um, nitrate levels in your pastures, your animals will lose condition, fat, which is the form of carbohydrate. So it's the same sort of concept. Once the nitrogen goes up, we run into problems. So in a crop, once you end up with high levels of nitrogen, you tend to get hollow stems. So nitrate re weeds are really like nature's safety valves. They're trying to get the nitrate out of the ground as quick as possible. So I think nitrate weeds are really a symptom of often um, management practices. Can we use judo management, meaning can we find out what's causing the problem, e.g. it's too much nitrate and not enough carbohydrate, excess equals deficiency, and potentially can we use, for example, sugar to overcome these problems. So what can we use or what management tools can we use against the weed, against itself? So if your nitrogen levels are up, let's try and think how we can try and balance things off. You can actually add sugar. Some people vary between 4 to 10 kilograms per hectare. It's not a major amount. So first thing people can look at substitute dollar value for urea for sugar and start to get to feed the biology because if you don't, the urea will actually then go on. The biology will strip the organic matter out of your soils. So remember this one, please. Um, Microseed at the first table, you may have heard that quite commonly. But if we don't, you'll find if you put urea on, the microbes are then going to try and strip that carbohydrate, that form of organic matter out of your soil. And again, you may have heard that sugar has been used by a lot of dairy farmers. Has any trials been used on sugar on the paddocks around here? Just the weirdos? I can get back to you. <laughs> okay, so there are some people that do some weird things. Good on you. So what we're trying to think about too is that instead of using straight nitrogen if you actually use the carbohydrate and the nitrogen together, some people will use a fish-based product. And then part of the question I'd like to ask is, has anybody tried fish and kelp? Now, kelp's fairly important because of two reasons. One, it's very high in boron, and the other one, it's very high in vanadium, and the vanadium's essential for fungal growth. So coming back to this issue of, you remember when you've got a drought, what can happen is the organic matter doesn't decompose properly and then as the organic matter, sorry, the organic matter slowly decomposes, the soil microbes are generally dormant and your nitrate levels tend to build up fairly quickly. So coming out of a drought, the longer the drought, the bigger the nitrate weeds that are going to happen. If you go and spray them out, 
what's the next plant that's going to come back? More nitrate weeds because they haven't completed their job. Now, past cropping will go through and utilise that. So start to think to yourself, OK, how, what's the function of these nitrate weeds? They're actually to cover the ground. And if you've got a healthy soil, you tend to have far fewer nitrate plants. So nitrate weeds are really the symptom. And if you think about it this way, could you go through and start to look at pasture cropping? Do people use pasture cropping up here? I don't hear a lot of... Last time I was up here, Colin Scythe pasture cropping. No, OK. One of the reasons for that with your high rainfall, a lot of nitrates washed out. But if you do have an extended dry period, you can actually use pasture cropping to actually utilise the nitrate that's already... Right, just starting to wind up. Just remember, if you do get wetter seasons or a lot of rain in a short period of time, the nitrate's going to leach out and potentially you bore on your, and your sulphur as well. OK, so here's our challenges. If you've actually got um, a soil which can be a beautiful, deep, healthy soil and can suddenly get nitrate weeds come on on it, or if you've got a rocky soil and it's got low fertility, you can still have nitrate weeds. Now, this took me about 15 years to work out, so I'm going to take just a couple of seconds to go through and I may just take a couple of minutes longer, is that you can have a beautiful soil. Once you get that surface sealing, it goes anaerobic. The nitrate levels build up and all of a sudden your nitrate weeds will take off. You can have a literally piece of rock and have really thick organic matter on the top and still have nitrate weeds as well. Can people relate to that? Okay. So what you're trying to think about is let's try and prevent the weed in the first place. Ask yourself what environmental decisions can I try and make to overcome that weed that's doing so well. Can I use this knowledge in a judo effect against the weed. So once you know what the weed is being caused from, for example, a nitrate weed, can you try and use sugar? The CSIRO has done trials on that. If a new weed, weed arrives, why is it occurring? Ask yourself the question, is it climatic as well? And also start to think to yourself, sorry, let's go back one point, is it becoming naturalised? So how many weeds have become naturalised up here? Many? If I do my research, sometimes in parkal situations, 50 years ago they used to call some of the legumes weeds and now they're what? Naturalised as part of it? I'm nearly finished. So take home messages. Pastures tell you where you're going. So you look at your pasture and you go, right, I can understand where the successional order is, but the actual weeds are telling you where you're going to go into the future. So please read your weeds. And also just think about going back to the landscape, like you've got fantastic landscapes up here. Uh, is your landscape aggrading or degrading and is your plant successional order changing? So start thinking about those different categories. As we said, we'll talk about them more tomorrow. There's a 14-page document that goes with this one. And start to try and think how you can use the weed against itself. Okay, weed management, it's very much a state of mind. When you're dealing with a weed as an indicator plant, it becomes an indicator plant the moment you decide that it is. Okay, it's just a state of mind. And please remember too with weeds that they can have a beneficial effect. Okay, just finishing last minute is weeds are indicator plants. We need to think weeds aren't basically a problem, they're really the symptom. And can you start to read the weeds form and function and that uh, book, um, Weeds and What They Tell by Fife, is a really good one to look at that one. Okay, think about your local succession list. We'll do that tomorrow. Think about moving what plants are productive and what plants are not. Think about if you're going to do this one, go from the shortest to the tallest, from the weakest to the strongest, and also think about plants' root systems. If you think about it too... Just remember where the legumes fit in and just try and think also if you've got a lot of grasses and you have still have high nitrate levels, those legumes aren't going to grow. Okay, when you think about high fertility spots and you're going to go look and try and find your plant list, at least 25, have a look at your stockyards, your septics, 
your wet areas, where your legumes are. Um, I came into central Queensland and I looked everywhere for legumes and couldn't find any. And then eventually I found one. Any suggestions where I found it? I associate legumes with calcium. I'll give you a clue. Sorry? Close. Someone actually poured a concrete step and the legume that I found was right next to the concrete because it was actually utilising the calcium out of the concrete. Okay, so just start to think about what communities you've got there. And two more to go. Basically, think going from short to tall. Just remember, as we try and have this successional order, what we actually are trying to do is build the topsoil and the succession will increase, but then if you get it too high, it goes over the other side. So I'm just putting this one up again. You can get to a maximum growth and the nitrate weeds, when they kick in, tends to be when your production starts falling away. So just on a couple of serious notes, um, we think about weeds from a human civilization perspective is really they are following in the footsteps of civilization. If we go and kill off all the weeds and we lose our civilization, I think we still lose. The other thing too, please, just ask yourself the simple question is that what are the weeds telling us? And your management really is like a steering wheel. Try and avoid running into major problems like weeds. Okay, thank you. Off. Thanks very much, Glenn.